got uh, Ask the Masters again. We are in our Mesa recording studio, actually at Red Rock Contractors, my, my business. Randy Beard's here with us, helping us put all this together, and I've got an incredible person with me today, Jan Moyer, who is an unbelievable landscape lighting designer. Um, been in the industry for years, probably m much longer than even I've been in the industry. Um, was breaking um, records when she got in here, because I can only guess, Jan, when you started this business in the 70s, how many females were involved in landscape, lighting, architect? I mean, you're an anomaly back then, I would Absolutely. assume. Absolutely. When I was still in school, um, there were three women lighting designers, in, in, not doing landscape lighting, do, lighting designers. At all. In the country. Oh, wow. Two in California that worked together and one in New York City. Wow. And that, that not un, unexpected, right? I mean, if you think about the design world on the architecture side and, and even the construction world, for, it's getting to be a little bit more um, regular to find women in that industry, but it, for years it was it, when you when there was a woman involved, it, she was either shunned. You know, we had done a um, an interview with Helen Larhet, uh, Helena Larhet, that used to work for Lautner, and when she got in this industry, she came from Chile, came to America as a licensed architect, and they almost didn't recognize her because well, the bigger, she wasn't allowed to be in that group. Yeah, and we were we were allowed to because there really isn't any licensing for lighting design. But the bigger issue that women in this industry face is the contractors and the engineers thinking, well, they couldn't know anything. Right. Mm -hmm. not, not getting the respect you deserve. And that mm -hmm. thing with Helena, she was not, not allowed, she, but she didn't get respected for her. She had the same education. She's certainly proven that she can out-architect many architects in this, in this world. John Lautner saw the, the, the uh, importance of how good she was. She took over his organization. Um, but early on, you know, she was almost, she would have been passed by, like, oh, no, if, if, if the architect's a woman, she can't do it. Um, she won't know, she won't understand. And, and the, the funny thing for me when it comes to design, um, I, you need so many different aspects of, of, of use of your brain. And so yeah. the, the female side of that information, mm -hmm. most men can't have at all. And just the different, just the different natural things that women and men do differently at any project we would work on just having one woman involved at any level Helps. can change the benefit on the yeah. outcome because they see it from their own perspective, which is yeah. considerably different. They feel things differently. They have more emotion. They, you know, yeah. a lot of those things that are, you know, maybe taboo to say are the reality, right? So when you, when you mix them together, they, the best results come out. And as you were talking about that, I was thinking about how when I first started, or when before I started, I realized I've got the design background because I was studying design, but I don't have enough technical background. So my last two years in college, I worked very hard to get the technical background that I needed. And then, <clears throat> after my first job, which was at the General Electric Lighting Institute, um, I went to Smith Henchman and Grills, which is an architectural engineering firm in Detroit, and then to the engineering enterprise in Berkeley, California. So for almost 10 years, I worked with engineers, wow. electrical engineers, really learning. And what it taught me was I can have a great idea, but I have to know when I put something on those drawings, it physically can be built. Correct. It's It's possible. Well, I, I, my, my guess is you also would have to work harder to prove yourself, with any, especially with new ideas. Like, it, if I was to propose that idea at the same time, it would, have been, it would have been accepted earlier, even if I was less qualified, less knowledgeable, Absolutely. just because I presented it. And so, luckily, I think that a lot of that has changed, but I'm that's sure. that's changed, but, yeah. Let oh, me yeah. just tell you this one, one oh, story, sure. which is a current story. I got contacted by a landscape architect in Saudi Arabia uh, in April or May. They were looking all over the world for someone to do the landscape lighting for <clears throat> a new villa that was being done for one of the royal family in Saudi okay. Arabia. And he couldn't find anyone. And he finally ended up asking two, two different people, myself and one lighting designer in Los Angeles. And that was it. So, and he came to me first. And he supported me to get the project in, of course. Good. I'm now working on the project. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So life has changed a little bit that way for sure. But I think at some level you can build a reputation to a point where it will precede you and help you. But I can early on I can only imagine. I want to actually understand better. So early in your career, in order probably in order to prove yourself too, that taking that, that aspect of life through the engineering stage of stuff and understanding the engineering side of lighting more than anything else. Then the next thing I did was I spent a lot of time outside at night with lighting equipment just trying things because there was no one I could learn from right 
And there wasn't textbooks on this stuff yet. And, which if is there the still next, isn't, right? Well, no, there still okay. there is, and that's what happened next. In in the late 1980s, I realized I had learned so much, and there were no textbooks, so right. I needed to write a book. And before I was even done writing the book, I'd become known worldwide for writing the book. Right. Because it didn't exist. And so didn't you exist. Built, you know, and it's like we just talked earlier about how important it can change. Like lighting changes a backyard dramatically. Bad lighting changes it some. Incredible lighting changes it immensely. And so just adding the right key things, it doesn't mean more lighting. It means more correct lighting. And it changes that whole environment and draws you to want to ex- enter that environment. Small little backyards can be twice as big when they're lit up. Big backyards can feel more intimate. And, it, and if you, in this environment, we're in Phoenix, Arizona, we go outside nine months out of the year and it's gorgeous. The well, way I think of it is that it gets dark every night. Yep. And what lighting can do for any garden, even an interior space, is to take away some of the darkness, to reveal some beautiful aspects of your landscape that you've lost because of the darkness. Absolutely. Well, I think you there's things you can enhance at night that you couldn't enhance during the day, especially with cool shadow lines and, and how you make those, those backdrops reflect off the top of water. Those things that you do with even bad lighting changes the backyard enough when we got reflective mirrors of glass for pools. But once you do it well, and that's and I've seen the difference. We've been landscape contractor now for 10 or 12 years. We've done most of our own lighting. It's only been up until recent till we've been starting to work with you on some projects. And the, the difference overall is that we put a little more effort into it for sure because of what we're doing. But the end result is 100 times past what the effort took. Um, and jobs of any size can, can benefit from it from sure, even just a little bit. But you just adding lighting to an outdoor landscape is a huge benefit adding it correctly it makes you it makes you use that backyard 24 7 365 like you said it gets dark every night i think i learned from skip phillips years ago um when somebody asked him you know somebody asked him how often he uses his pool and he said every day like you swim in the winter he goes no you didn't ask me if i went swimming <laughs> you asked me if i used my pool he goes i built a beautiful backyard because i want to look at it every day that's I don't great. want to just look at it on Thursday or when I go swimming on a Monday. I want to open up my back of my house, look out at my beautiful gardens, and be like, this is mine, and I can enjoy it every day. And I think lighting brings it in it absolutely through the does. night as well. There's a project that I worked on in San Francisco many, many years ago, and we had done all the lighting in the house, and the, <clears throat> the guy who was the builder went to back to school and became an architect. And then we started working on the outside. The house went up three stories, and it was a, a steep, San, typical San Francisco property that went way down. And we looked at each other when we started working on these three levels of garden and said, do you think these clients will ever even go out there? And the architect said, no. And I said, oh, yeah, they will. And mm-hmm. they go out there every night. And you're going to draw. And if you draw them out, they will. Yeah. Right? You can create, you can have, because daylight, daytime, you can create all these really cool, quiet spaces, and intimate spaces here. If it's nighttime, you're never going to wander to those spaces, especially depending on different locations. You've got concerns with not being able to see who's out there and critters and whatever else. And so just adding some lighting gives you the ability to sit out there and enjoy the ambiance for sure. And lighting allows you to to draw people out by using brightness to make them interested in what is that out there. So one of the tools that we use in landscape lighting is what we call visual destination, making some part in the very back part of the property the brightest thing so that people want to go out there. And I think we learn that too through the pool side. And we same thing with pools with like fire features and lighting is when we have a backyard, we like to get that feature, light, fire, whatever, to the back side of a pool maybe or something. So you don't just see anything bright in the foreground makes you lose the background, mm-hmm. right? As long as you move the light to the background, now you not only see the background, now you've enjoyed the entire foreground as well. That's and right. That could be a swimming pool, that could be <laughs> gardens, that could be whatever, but you're absolutely right. Putting that out there creates the reason to leave and go to it and lets you also enjoy everything else to get there. One of the things people don't understand is that line of the window from the interior to the exterior. <clears throat> Some people think you need to put light on the window which does absolutely nothing. And what you really need to think about is everything that the window can see and make sure that there is light outside that window that in any place that you want people to see. And then you have to think about the fact that interior levels in residential are typically about 10 times brighter than the landscape lighting levels that we do. So you have to decide, am I going to turn the interior lights down in order to be able to see out the window or do I need to have at least two levels, a really bright level outside so you can see it through the window 
And then when you want to go outside, dim it down so, so that it's more it comfortable. Bit. Yeah. I mean, again, simple little tricks that without without understanding some of those tricks and going through, one, the knowledge of learning through school, but more, impa- more important is application of it, right? And like you said, you spend all this time out at night messing with lighting. You can't put that in a textbook necessarily. You can get the idea of, hey, you can create a shadow by doing this, but until you went out there to figure out how to create the shadow and so you know and what the next thing light I did up the was? tree, you need to light the wall behind it, right? So the next thing I did was to start um, a nonprofit, an educational nonprofit called the International Landscape Lighting Institute, okay. or ILLI. And it's exactly for that reason. I can put everything in a book, and you still don't necessarily learn it. You've got to get out there yourself. So we teach a class that we call the intensive course. And it's five days and five nights, 10 hours a day. Oh, wow. And what the groups do, and they work in groups, they design the lighting for this area, and they do a full-scale mock-up of the entire area. Okay. And then they, um, on the last night of the class, we call it the reveal. They, we invite the entire community, wherever it is, to come and each group presents their design to the community. Okay. What they did, what their challenges were, how much it's going to cost, what's the wattage, and imagine the difference in wattage now than oh, yeah. from before. With LEDs. With LEDs. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 I can, back in the day, we, we have way more problems with wattage needs and line loss over, over distance. And if you weren't careful, and didn't, you had to be a lot more knowledgeable about those things just so you didn't have this light bright and this one almost dim. And you could start also, once you start burning out some lights, now you have more voltage going to everything else. So now they're burning out faster. There's a whole different scenario if you don't plan it correctly. Again, That's right. you know, I, I think we're, you know, we, with Ask the Masters too, we've been doing um, multiple events now. And we've got more scheduled to do these hands-on events because you can learn a lot from a book. You can learn more sitting in a classroom, getting it taught to you, but you retain so much more when you apply it when you actually um, do it yeah. and 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 then you also you you gain so much more because you get the benefit the best thing about what you and i do for a living at any level is the reveals right you no matter what, i just ran with randy to one of my projects because i, I had to run out there and drop off some stuff i'm like hey come see this project we just we're just wrapping it up um but it's, it's at the point where you want to start revealing stuff because it's because everything's going on but that like only because i was so proud to show off what we're doing mm-hmm. um and very few industries get to do that you know a lot of their stuff is a microchip stuffed in a laptop and Nobody gets to see, hey, it's super fast. Hmm, yeehaw. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when you can, you know, but then you drive down the freeway and you go, oh, there's the musical instrument we see. And we, we did that job, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, it gives you some benefit. And when you actually get to apply that stuff in the field, you remember it. And then you get more excited about doing it versus, you know, listening to somebody drone on about how voltage and amperage draws. And, you know, you're like, oh, okay, and, but John. But all okay. that stuff is still important. Oh, it's critically important. But We it just, still need to know it all before we go out and and do something that might be a little different. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think I think the point is though that it makes you want to learn even more of it. Absolutely. That's we you know when we were talking earlier with one of the other interviews we've done before getting an education makes you need more education mm-hmm. because the as you start learning stuff it actually teaches you how much you don't know. Um, you think about landscape lighting, you think, okay, I just need to know wattages. And if I feel like if I go to Ewing and take a landscape lighting course they'll put on, it's going to be about transformers, line voltage and and how the lights work. It's not going to be about why we're using lights in the first place and what kind of what we're going to create out of it. Um, and so there's there's so many different ways to learn that, but you the, the difference is applying that knowledge and understanding the end of results, for sure. Um, so you've written some books, I think, more than one? Yes, and the okay. book that I'm writing right now, I call it a companion book. It's by a completely different um, publisher. It's out of London, okay. and it's called The Art of Landscape Lighting. So it will be a companion to the landscape lighting book, which is the textbook, in that it's going to show all the beautiful projects and how we got to making those decisions and what made it work and what new things did we have to come up with. Like when I started work on the Chicago Botanic Garden, we wanted to provide you a view across from one island to another, across a body of water. And the whole middle of the island was just grass. It was beautiful. But it was just grasses. So I had to figure out some way to connect the left and right sides of the island visually at night with lighting. And what I came up with is a new technique that I call shore scraping. And it requires fixtures to be in the water and be rated to be in the water, but above the water, not submersible. And then you just scrape the shore 
So if you're going to be out on that island, you've got to turn the shore scraping off. There's no way to shield it. Huh. But as a view, it's a wonderful way to connect. Uh -huh. And I've used it over and over, and so have many other people. Wow. Well, I'm gonna, I don't want to lose track of this, so remind me. I want to go back to some of your favorite projects. But let's talk about your textbook a little bit. So okay. just, just in general, kind of give me the... the the, the cliff notes I would want if I was going through college. What's what's in that book? What's that book going to provide to me? Um, and and it, we'll put in our show notes and stuff, even how someone can get one of those books. Great. Everything that you need to understand from why we do lighting, how to interact with the client, how a client may or may not understand lighting, how to think through conceptual design, how to do the, the um, documents to present your... Uh, ideas during conceptual design, how to do the contract documents, how to do the transformer schedule and the fixture schedule, how fixtures are built, what to look for in fixtures, how lamps have changed, right. uh, what you need to know about lamps and how they work, um, uh, electrical engineering primarily from the power distribution standpoint, and then all of the techniques of landscape lighting that we use in both residential and um, commercial and all of the areas, like we have a whole chapter on water features. We have a whole chapter on structures. We have two chapters on plant material. One is lighting plant material, and then the other is uh, all the changes that happen over time, which we call garden evolution. Um, but the chapter that really brought this book to life was the, is the chapter on materials, finish, and corrosion. Okay. There are 13 kinds of corrosion that we have to deal with in landscape lighting. And when I was a young lighting designer, nobody knew anything. All the manufacturers that are doing landscape lighting today learned about corrosion from me. That's awesome. It is awesome. Well, it's funny, you know, you, you brought up a thing I don't even, you don't even think about very often. When we build a pool or build a building, we light it, it doesn't change, right? But when the you, landscape, when you light a landscape is always it's, it's going to change. So you've got to make it look beautiful today, and you've got to be prepared so it stays looking beautiful over time. And one, you don't lose lights in the, in the, in the ground from everything growing it over, but mm -hmm. also that as the tree get, grows and gets bigger or the plants get changed and go dormant and all those things, right? You're or plants to, die or, or plants clients die. add whole new gardens or new garden features. Yeah. And it's not even just that. It's all the changes throughout the seasons. Well, right. You're going to lose leaves. So now that mm -hmm. tree you've been making your iconic yeah. piece of your property and you're in the in a colder climate, you lose all the leaves. Now you got to make sure everything else can support the fact that the tree no longer looks like that. So. And one of the first things you have to think about for garden evolution or for landscape lighting is power distribution. Yep. If you do nothing on a project that's that's a new construction project, but power distribution, that sets them up for adding lighting for the rest of eternity, right. essentially. They can always come back and modify it if they have power where they might need it, for sure. Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's funny how dynamic that part of this process, and I think my experience would be it gets overlooked. Um, you know, I, every neighborhood I've ever lived in on my own personal side, I, I feel like my yard was always the, always the most dynamic because we lit it up. Um, and I, even where I live today, I would say that 10 houses either direction from my house, no landscape lighting. Um, and you just start pulling down the street and you see this house, and that's my place. Um, and I think everybody else sees it but doesn't know how to do that, right? Yeah. But, and it's, and I'm, it's nothing super spectacular, but it's enough to where it invites you to want to see the house and it makes you want to come down the street and it makes the house also feel safer and more inviting. Um, and, and I do that with how we build walkways to the entrance and stuff too so it doesn't feel cordoned off. But lighting at night makes makes the biggest influence on inviting people to the space and, Absolutely. It, and, it, and it has to be there Absolutely. Um, and I feel like it's to me it seems like it's 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 that last I'm like okay well we can't afford to put the lighting off let's back up let's let the trees grow let's let the plants get bigger let's make sure we put the lights in though because we can all you know as much as I'd like to put a 60 inch box tree in my backyard I don't want to do that if I can't afford lighting I'd rather put a 36 inch box tree put the lights in because in four years I get my tree and my lights. And another way of looking at that, that's a great way to approach it. Another way is, okay, we can't afford all of it now. Let's do a, a master plan so we know right. what, what it could cost. And then let's pick the most important thing. What's the most important view or the most important element and light that well. Right. And then let and time go by. Rest. So get and, power distribution correct. Yeah. Have a good master plan. Put enough accents in that you can enjoy it today and then build it over time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and as the environment changes and it grows, like you talked, you're going to want to change some of it anyway. And oh. maybe refocus something somewhere else. And Sometimes it's complete change. Wow. And sometimes it's just adding as trees grow or new things get added into the landscape. 
So I, I brought this up. What's what's your favorite project you ever got a chance to work on? Oh my god, there's probably numbers of them. But like, mm -hmm. if you name me a couple that you got to work on that somebody might even recognize. Oh, well, one of them very early on. Um, oh gosh, what's the name of it? It was it's a resort in Southern California, um, the Vintage Club. Okay. Uh, that was really wonderful. Um, and uh, I don't know, there's so many wonderful ones. I worked on Farniente Vineyards. Um, I worked on their caves. I worked on their landscape. I worked on some of the buildings. Um, there's just so many, it's hard to say. Some of the most interesting ones, maybe, uh, I worked on a 13,000 acre ranch in Colorado. Oh, wow. And from the smoking porch, which is an outside porch where they put, um, uh, what do you call them? rugs down, rugs from animals down uh, to sit and smoke. You can look across the Colorado River to about a mile down the road, a group of cottonwood trees that we lit. We lit everything in right. between as but, well. But that's but, what you see from the iconic entrance. Yeah, and you see the river going through it. It's it's just amazing. Wow. So, it, you know, it's funny. I think the first time you brought up caves, so it kind of cued me off. I think the first time I recognized the need for a lighting designer, we were actually working inside of a house in a trophy room. But everything was black. Everything was dark. Um, we thought we had lots of light too. We initially designed it with under a shelf, like it had a bunch of trophies. It was a professional athlete, um, and so we set it all up with all these all these parts and pieces, and thought we'd have all the. And the it was it was intensely uncomfortable to be in the space. Oh my goodness! Because we because the way we initially lit it, and because it, the walls were absorbing so much of the light, we couldn't. It didn't feel light in the room. If the if it was sunny out, though, there was one window that you had trouble looking yep. at, and as soon as you looked at that, you couldn't see anything in the room, no matter yep. how much we turned the lights up. And so, it and we brought in a lighting designer, and he laughed at us basically, but he came in and said, "Well, obviously, you, you, this is the problem: is you got wall color issues, all your yeah, furnishings, you gotta change the finishes, we, and, and or we got to change how we're doing lighting." And so he was able to, with, with some minor finish changes, but mostly lighting changes. Mm -hmm. Make it was literally uncomfortable to be in the space, wow. um, and you couldn't you couldn't read or see or you know, and so. That, that taught me really well early on that uh, the importance of, of understanding lighting, right? Understanding how colors reflect and, and how that changes things. Because, um, you know, black surfaces just literally absorb it where it doesn't, but white surfaces completely reflect it and almost duplicate or, you know, add to it. So, But you can also have a black surface with a shiny finish and it, refl it reflects everything right back into your eye as glare. And, right, and then yeah, that's part of that uncomfortableness, right? We mm -hmm. had this room pretty well lit up, but it was glary the whole time. I mean, there was nothing that worked in there, surprisingly, especially during the day. Wow. And, you know, because the window, was, window. The window would screw. It was better to close the window off and you could get your eyes to sort of adjust. And I think that is similar to landscape lighting as well. If you if you if you're not careful by lighting, if you don't light it enough, your eyes have to continue to open and close mm -hmm. and adjust and so it can feel less comfortable then you have to get enough of it lit up so that your eyes can kind of relax. And, and it's not up. necessarily enough of it, it's the brightness relationship between one area and another. Right. Um, which is called luminance balance. Okay. We need to make sure that there's not too much contrast between any of the areas. And that's even more important as we age. And living out here in Arizona, and I live in a, in a retirement community, yep. 55 plus, uh, it becomes really critical for older people. Oh, I'm sure. And, I, and I, as I'm aging now, I can tell the difference in my eyes. But that's that. I think you explained it much better than me. But it's really the contrast of mm -hmm. if you go from lights to dark, it was that window in the room yep. that would that would disallow you from relaxing and being comfortable in the scene. And every time you turned your head, you would lose the ability to see what you're looking at. And then you'd get back and you'd get blasted by the window. So, um, you know, it, lighting is such an important aspect of architecture, you know, as well. And I think... We, we talk about landscape lighting. It's not about the landscape only because mostly most of what will light up in the landscape lighting is the architecture in the background as well. And it totally transforms what that looks like if you light the landscape well because you actually are utilizing the architecture, right, to, to help you enhance what you're lighting in the landscape. Well, the architecture is often really critical because it's where people go. So you want to include it. You don't want right. to leave it out. But also, you don't want to leave out elements that are important in the landscape. And you were mentioning that um, when we're dealing with the architecture, we're dealing with vertical surfaces. Right. And that's the most important thing, no matter whether it's a wall or a tree, a, a water feature, or a building. It's the vertical surfaces that we humans see first. So it's way more important than any kind of horizontal surface, including pathways and stairs. Hmm. 
which doesn't mean that we shouldn't light pathways and stairs, but we need to light the things around them so that we feel comfortable when we're traversing along a pathway or up or down a set of stairs. And keeping the contrast nice enough that you don't get blinded by the building and then you can't see your path. Absolutely. Right, even though you can focus on the path and eventually be able to see it. Yeah. If there's too much contrast as you look around yourself, you lose, like I said, it makes you almost feel uncomfortable. And I Absolutely. Think, I think, you know, bad design, meaning bad like scale and bad how it's not set, like you walk in a backyard that was scaled incorrectly or, or, or just the, the angles and lines aren't working with each other, the rhythm's wrong. All those little design elements you learn on the architecture side can do the same thing. It makes you feel uncomfortable and you don't, you don't want to be in the space. Lighting yep. can do the same thing to you. It, yep. can, it can turn you away, especially the lack of it, I think. But when, when you do it correctly, it helps you. But or scary wrong, lighting. Right. Scary lighting is probably worse than no lighting. Right. Or terrible lighting. Like or terrible lighting. It's reflecting lighting. too much yeah. and, you know, and you thought it was going to be great. You've actually yeah. ruined the environment. And, and sometimes it's just if we just bend these over here and we focus this one over here, we don't even have to get new lights. We just need right. to put them where they belong uh, and focus them in the right place. And shield them properly. Shield them. And, yeah. So you're not staring into them. Right. Yeah. So, so you were talking about how that's really important and it makes us want to feel like we can go outside in Arizona or in Hawaii or in any of the areas uh, where it's warm at this time of year. But lighting in snow is the best. I was just going to ask that. So in the winter situation where you get a lot of snow, you must have you must design differently, right? Because you are going to lose some of the lights, right? Depending mm -hmm. on where they're put. You're not going to design it at all differently. You have to keep it in mind. So if you're in an area where you're going to have three foot of snowpack all winter, so the fixture is going to be buried under two foot of snow, Th that won't work. So you either have to turn the lights on during a snowstorm to keep snow from burying the fixtures or just realize that some of the lighting won't work in the winter and have that be a zone that you just don't turn on. But other than that, there's no difference. You don't treat it, you don't have to treat right. it any differently. But you might enhance areas or, or try to get lights in places where you won't lose them as much maybe. Absolutely. But, and like you said, and then zone it correctly so you don't burn a bunch of lights underground in the snow that you can't even see just so yeah. you have that tree lit up, right? Yeah. Um, and a, and a, but it's really critical to have that visual connection from the inside to the outside. When I finished a project in Villanova, Pennsylvania one year, years ago, I said to the client as I was leaving, "Let call me the first time it snows. Go up in your office. He had this view down this incredible alley that we lit of trees. Call me when it's snowing and tell me what you think. So at midnight one night, I get this call from him and he's like a little kid. <laughs> oh my God, this is amazing. I can only, well, you're going to get some snow on the trees, which is going to pick up a lot of reflection. You're going to get the light that's bouncing off the ground. I mean, I can only imagine how much that environment yeah. will change. And we don't see that much in this part of the Arizona. No, we, we don't But obviously get up it. north. And, and, but again, you get to, so many people, I think, are, are uh, misunderstand how critical it is to do good lighting on a landscape, and, or any lighting for that matter. But it, it's, it adds so much, so often, and, and, and allows you to, like, if it was, if he hadn't had the lighting, that you put in for that whole project, all it would be is cold and gloomy and wet outside. Yeah. And, and so instead, it, he probably wanted to, well, one calls you giddy, yes. but two has to get out there, right? I gotta, oh, he I wanna, was, I wanna he walk gotta get out there. I see it, I gotta take pictures, I gotta show my friends. Yeah. And he wants to be in his office at night so he can look out no matter what season it is. And that's really important for people that live in cold climates oh, yeah. because of seasonal affective disorder. Oh, yeah. I have no proof, but I believe very strongly that if you have landscape lighting out your window, out the window of a hospital, it can help people heal. Yeah, I would. I've spent a little bit of time in Alaska, and I can only imagine how much more beneficial that would be. And like, like we talked, my house is only lit up on the street. Same. I mean, it, it's not going to be light for 12, 14, 16 hours, right? We're going to get a little exactly. hint of a sun coming by. Exactly. And you, you have the, the disorder you discussed. If you would light all that space up, you, I'm, I know there's no proof, but I would, I would join the same bandwagon here. There's absolutely no way that hasn't enhanced yeah. that person's life and made made that a less effective. Even if sure. all it does is give you joy, exactly. Which landscape lighting and good landscape and a nice warm pool can do. And now you're, you're writing a new book now, which is the yeah. parley, but it's I'm assuming it's it's the coffee table version of your textbook. It's the coffee table version. So yep. we're gonna we're gonna get those images of like the project we just did together mm -hmm. that are, that just blow mm -hmm. people away and. and yep see the, the, the benefit of all that labor, right? Yep. All that time and all that expertise. Because, um, that, again, that's the, the best thing about what we do as a contractor is not even the house we build. I, I've told this a hundred times. I can build the best house in the world, but I can screw it up in two seconds with a bad landscape or a bad pool project. Or bad lighting. Or bad lighting, right? So Inside you, or yeah, out. You force any of those things into that context, but the 100% opposite is also exactly true. I can mm -hmm. take a total turd of mm -hmm. a building 
and make it fabulous. and make it fabulous with landscape and lighting and pools and water yep. features. Yep. Just because it, it, the architecture usually gets the most amount of focus, and we're always last, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've shown up to a thousand projects where the architects already got the house done, the house is already under construction, house lighting's done, mechanical engineer everybody's involved, and oh yeah, by the way, we need to do a pool and landscape. And you got a week, you know, like, and you have a like, week. like yeah. if they would recognize how important that would be to be in the beginning, in the beginning. it would change so that we can integrate everything. Together. Oh yeah. And you might yeah. even adjust architecture based Absolutely. on how we can light it differently or yeah. like, you know what, this is going to be so flat. If we could get a little adjustment in elevation here, yep. or can I get an opening here to get some plants and trees versus the hardscape? And that often happens. It's, we, we always seem to cut most of the time, not always. I think the the higher up the food chain we've gotten in our projects, the more often it is that they bring a group of designers together and build a team. Um, and we try to get as many people on the team, the interior designer, the lighting designer, the in exterior lighting designer, the landscape contract, all, you know, all everybody. Landscape architect, everybody, yeah. because we can all help each other. Yeah. And, and usually, if you're educated enough, you can actually help enhance everything without screwing it up. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're the dumbest one in the room and you just got to sit back and listen and interject a little bit. Sometimes you're the, one of the smarter ones in the room and you can really help take a project and turn it into a direction that makes the client overwhelmed and, and happy with it. So, yep. Well, I, I, I love what you do. Um, I think the industry needs to know more that there's more information out there. You have the same problem we've had in the pool industry for years. I talk to pool builders that have been in the business for 10 years and they don't understand that there's an education program out there for them. You know, they, they're, I'm out there to help them. I've been hired to help them fix a pool. They're already screwing up because the client was even concerned enough. And I'm like, you know, have you got any education in pools at all? No. I'm like, there isn't, there isn't such a thing. I'm like, there's a yeah. lot of education available to you. And you're in the industry, people are in the industry for years and years and years and not realize that there's people out there that want to share their knowledge, will enhance their, their future and their career dramatically, and again, will actually make them want more, right? And that's the coffee table book would do the same. But if I was to sit in your landscape class and landscape lighting class with how little I know to start, I can guarantee you in first couple hours of that class, I've actually learned more what I don't know than mm -hmm. I've currently learned, which makes me want to get more and more information to finish. That class has been going on since the late 1980s. The, the um, 501c3 didn't start until 2010, and, and, and it's continuing without me. I'm no longer, I'm the founder, but I'm not running it any longer. Okay. But every single person that's taken the class has said it's changed their life. It has to. So let's. how often is that class taught in general terms, not, not necessarily every minute, but how often do you teach that, or how often is it, is it taught, maybe where is it taught once in a while, and, and what's the, kind of the structure of it? It's all changing right now because um, it's going off in a different direction, which is great. Um, right now it's, it's essentially based in Texas. Okay. And the next class will be this spring in Texas, and they're starting the registration right now. Then there will be one in the fall, and in the future they're hoping to have at least three a year. Okay. Um, and they're hoping to have an online beginning course okay. to help people get prepared for taking this intensive course. Okay. And it's, is this a five-day course? It's five days and five nights. Okay. And that's so. It, so we use it as the textbook, mm -hmm. as well as we do the application of it through. So you're doing some textbook stuff, some work during the day, and some work at night, yep. and bouncing around. Yep. Okay. There's both lectures and demonstrations, and then site work of design and pulling all the equipment, getting it all set up, and then turning down the first night and realizing, oh yeah, that doesn't work, and figuring yep. out how they're going to make it work. That's cool. That's great. What? Did, give me an idea of ballpark. What are those classes? What does it take? I think it's about thirty-five hundred dollars. Okay. So that's a reason for for. Five days of intensive education. It's amazing. It, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's one of those classes, I think you said, it changed your life. And when you walk out, you walk out with more information and, and you know, the, from the textbook and the knowledge that it's worth 10 times what you paid for it. You know, we, um, Dave Peterson teaches a hydraulic course in swimming pools. And it's, it's basically taking a guy that's got, Dave Peterson, who's got 20 or 30 years of civil engineering and hydraulic background, that which would cover all gamuts from sewage treatment facilities to nuclear hydraulic, you know, all that stuff, and taking all the junk out and turn it into a class for pool builders. Yeah. So that's he basically great. took, you know, a fifty thousand dollar education or more, right, and take all the right snippets and made the cliff notes for the pool side of that world, and then created all kinds of equations and programs in a software system that'll help any pool builder use, right? Just same thing in lighting. There's the same thing, but this. So he's but he's taken all that generic information that could cover any gamut and trimmed it to what a pool builder needs to know. And then he teaches that to you in a th two different three-day courses. I don't care what he's charging. Yeah, The software right. you walk out with, even if he was the worst instructor in the world, will save your company <laughs> in the future from 
lawsuits or problems or upset customers because you don't understand hydraulics. Yeah. And the lighting would be the same way, right? You get into that class and you now have the knowledge, you now have the understanding, you know how to sell it. You'll actually sell bigger jobs, better jobs, and put more money into the projects because the clients see the benefit. I think they much more see the benefit of putting lighting in than anything else. Um, the mm -hmm. problem is getting them there because it's the last piece they get to see. Yep. But if you can get them there, you'll get them there. And even if you just set up a couple display lights at one night to say, you've got to have lighting, let me show you, 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 they'll come back. And and these days, you don't even have to do a mock-up for them if you if you don't want to. If you've got a, a client that's hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away, you can have them take a photograph or you can take a photograph on site and you can take it into Photoshop yep. and do a complete rendering of what it's what it could look like. Well, it's funny. So we use a rendering program here, software that we bring everything into that we do on our pool designs and same thing. It's, it's much more tedious. But we do, when we want to do night shots, we literally have to come in and drop all the lights. We have to aim them, give them their, you know, the color of the light, the, the spread of the light, and, and um, intensity. And we put them all. And we and the benefit of that is we can nope. Your night class that you got to do three times. We're literally like nope. Move it there. Move it here. Yep. Move it here. Change the angle. Change the yep. color. But again, same thing. We take a rendered house project. If I look at it in bright daylight when I render it for a client, it looks beautiful. It's okay. When I take it and put it in dusk and add the lighting to the outside and put the house lights on and light up some of the trees, a million bucks. All right, I've got to say one thing that's really important. If you can see landscape lighting at dusk, it will be too bright at night. Okay. That's really important. But it looks great on my rendering. I'm no, sure. But I, yeah, but I can, I'm see, sure I, can, it does. I can understand what you mean. If, if, if you can see it then, it's way too early. It's, so, yeah, it's way too early. Yep. And yeah. it'll be, well, then we just dim it down, right? We can tie just, it to yeah. the astrological clock and make it and, do all that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You can do all that. Yeah, there's really no limitations on what we can do with landscape lighting. That's awesome. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day before the holidays. Um, I already got a wealth of information just from having the interview with you. Um, we've obviously worked together before, so that's helped us as well. Um, we'll maybe we'll even do this again in the future because there's probably we could probably put ten segments together with you on different aspects of lighting. Oh, you maybe. could. So, yes. So we, we we will talk about that in the future. Okay. Um, but I want to. Wish you and your family a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. And to you too, and to and, Randy too. And everybody else, just so you know, this is Jan Moyer. She is going to, you'll look in her show notes and explain, get, tell you how to get a hold of her book if you want to, her foundation for teaching and landscape lighting. And this is Rick Chafee with Red Rock Contractors and Ask the Masters. And we are out.